But it gives us great pleasure to welcome Mike Parker Pearson to uh, Megalithomania 2021. So we've got a few questions for you. Um, I'll just run through them. Um, firstly, um, thank you for taking the time to do this. We know how busy you are. We know it's kind of late at night now. Um, and uh, we hope you haven't, uh, hope it's not too much uh, wine with your meal, um, but we, it should be fine. Um, so we've got a first question from someone you know, it's Simon Banton. Oh, yes. Yeah. He asks, I'm going to, I'll relay the questions, uh, otherwise it will get a bit a bit chaotic, but I'll just uh, relay it for you. Uh, so he says, hi, Mike, when you say that on a clear day, you can see the coast of Ireland to the west, do you actually mean the site of Wayne Morn or from the top of the ridge above it? Jonathan Morris and I have been doing some uh, view shared analysis. As far as we can tell, you, you'd have to climb up the ridge unless you can tell us differently. So any clarification would be yeah. my problem. No, you really can see it from the area of the circle itself. Uh, so you, you've just got to be there on the right day, Simon, when uh, the visibility is very clear. Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there is no doubt about it. So uh, I don't know if you had a chance to go over the ridge onto Bank V, the, the uh, Neolithic Causeway enclosure, which was uh, also reoccupied around 3000 BC. But you've also got fantastic views there. Uh, and you can actually see uh, Lundy, the very vertical cliffs of Lundy, uh, again, on a, on a fine day. So it's a fantastic area for, for getting the, these uh, really, really long distance vistas. OK, and we've got a question from Hugh Evans, um, and he, he's got a couple of little points here. One of them is... The, you know, what does Wayne Morn or Wayne Moun mean? Uh, you know, what is the meaning of that name? Do you, do, is, there, is there a translation of that? Yes, it means P.T. Moreland. Okay. So, uh, yes, I feel it's, it's a very unexotic name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he asks, um, what happened to the people there, um, you know, from that particular area? Um, it, there seems to be not much information. Yes, uh, and that's something we're, we're hoping to do a bit more investigation with because um, the radiocarbon dates just fall away after 3000 BC. And the same goes for, for monuments and other known archeological sites. We've really got nothing until the Beaker period, uh, shortly before 2000 BC. So uh, it, it's all very mysterious. It's a big problem for the whole of South Wales, in fact, that uh, late Neolithic monuments are extremely scarce. So uh, you know, one of the things I want to find out and, and working out different ways of, of how we might find out is whether we have got some kind of desertion, you know, large scale desertion of that, of that entire land. Um, you know, we, we, we've, we've got a handful of radiocarbon dates, I think uh, for, for the whole of North Pembrokeshire, Pembrokeshire, maybe just three radiocarbon dates fall in that thousand years after 3000. Uh, so not everybody left, but it, you know, if, if that is the case, um, but I, I'd like to be sure of that and to see if we can develop ways of being able to, to find out more. But it's a, it, it's, it's a fascinating possibility. Ali Cooper asks, um, you know, kind of a follow on to the last question, really. What do you think? Why do you think people move from Wales to Stonehenge? Mm. Um, he's got a couple of ideas, but he suggests um, and also asks, uh, about the bones of people who grew up in Wales, were they buried um, beneath one of the Welsh stones? I'm guessing either in Wales or at Stonehenge. Uh, basically about, you know, why did they go to Stonehenge? That's, that's the main question. Mm, yes. Um, well, if you ask our students, they'd say it has to be because of the appalling weather. <laughs> because uh, it's uh, our excavations there each September. We, we've had some really trying uh, weather conditions. And uh, 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 but I think I think it's possibly more than that. Um, you know, what, what we see across Britain after 3000 BC, so 400 years later, is that there does seem to be a, a, an economic and population decline. That's what my colleagues at UCL are suggesting from looking at a whole range of evidence. Um, but this is this is that much earlier. And it could be that we are seeing a phase of, of, of what, soil exhaustion, um, you know, 
loss of, uh, of, of crops and fertility and so on. Um, but I, I, really, I, I really don't know what it is that, that drives it, I have to say. But, you know, that's, some, that's something we can start trying to find out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we've got a question from actually one of our other speakers, Howard Crowhurst, and he asks about the, the fact that the outer ditch diameter is the same as Wayne Mound, um, and it indicates a careful measurement method. And he asks what your view is on that. Yeah. Um, well, I was lucky enough to work with a former colleague, uh, Professor Andrew Chamberlain, who is... Uh, uh, although he's an osteologist, he's got a very good head for, for numbers. And uh, he proposed back in 2007 that the Stonehenge uh, diameters um, were actually laid out according to a, a, a method of a metrological system, uh, one that he'd actually noticed from the work of John uh, Michel, uh, which is known as the, the, uh, the long foot which is somewhere just over 32 centimeters. And uh, what he proposed was that actually, you could see that they were using this in, uh, uh, in multiples of 10 uh, uh, as, as, uh, for the diameter of the Aubrey holes, the, uh, uh, the bank and the ditch at Stonehenge. And um, he, uh, uh, he, we, uh, he was also able to apply this to some of the other monuments at Darrington Walls, the timber monuments, such as the Southern Circle. So it's very possible that that could be the same unit of measurement. Interestingly enough, it's very specific um, that although it works in Southern Wessex, there is no such system of measurement at Avebury at all. And uh, it would seem that in Northern Britain, uh, where Alexander Tom formulated his megalithic yard, they're working on a different measurement system too. So, so that, that's, that's one possibility. That's, that's really interesting. I'm so glad you mentioned John Michel is kind of uh, many of our, our hero. So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, we've got a question from another one of our speakers, Caroline Wise, and she, she's talking about the kind of, you know, droving pigs down over large distances. Mm. Uh, and, and it must have been, they must have been very important to do so, but a huge mm. amount of effort. Um, and do you have any ideas about the routes they may have taken? Mm. Um, yeah, I think what, one, of the, one of the interesting aspects that we're learning from the isotopes is that um, we can reconstruct uh, some of these kinds of routes. For example, uh, 800 years before Stonehenge, uh, seven or eight hundred years before, we have uh, people buried at, uh, at Hazelton uh, uh, Long Cairn in Gloucestershire. And a recent study has shown that uh, uh, people as they uh, in their childhood were moving back and forth uh, to uh, 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 the other side of the um, Severn Estuary uh, to the, uh, what is it, is it the carbonates, the, the coal measures of South Wales? so that we can, you know, we can actually estimate the likely routes that they're going to be taking in what would have been a transhuman movement. And you know, we also know that we have stone axe exchange right across Britain. So places like Langdale really are producing on an industrial scale. And these axes, are, these axe heads are, are being exchanged all across the country. So you know, I think we have to recognize that there is long distance movement. It's also an island where uh, sea travel, coastal travel is going to be relatively easy. So you can make these long journeys by boat along coasts, up rivers, uh, so that the pigs and the cows don't necessarily have to walk themselves. And indeed the first Neolithic farmers to arrive in Britain had to bring their own domesticated animals in boats. So, yeah, you know, there, there are many ways of moving around the country, but I, I suspect it was, yeah, it, it wasn't the dense impenetrable forest that is sometimes characterized as that, that we have really quite sophisticated networks of communication. Okay, thank you. We've got a, a few more questions coming in. We've got one from Viv and she asks, um, is there any evidence for the removed wooden posts being reused? Ah, yes. So the posts at Darrington Walls um, 
when when they pulled out the circles, uh, the, the post of the circle, uh, from exactly the same date is when they built or rather extended the southern circle within Darrington Walls. So it goes from a relatively tiny monument to six concentric rings and somewhere around 200 posts. So uh, it's very possible that that's where some of those posts go. Um, the other thing is that as they're pulling them out, they're digging the ditch. And that ditch was dug to a depth of five and a half meters, 10 meters wide, near vertical sides. So you have to have some kind of ladder to get out uh, because you're basketing chalk ultimately up five and a half meters. And at that point, your spoil tip, the bank uh, of the henge is going to be, we estimate about three meters high. So you know, one possibility is that they're also reusing them as ladders. So basically notched poles uh, and you, you climb up the, the notches um, to, to, to get out. We have a question from A. Williams, and they ask, can Mike elaborate on solution hollows at Durrington? You just ask, what are they? All right. Um, it's one of the things that we find in um, uh, calcareous landscapes in limestone and chalk is that um, water percolating uh, through the, the rock and underground creates these, um, these erosional uh, holes. And you'll have seen sometimes on the television that, you know, a car has <laughs> fallen straight down a, a hole uh, that's, that's uh, opened up underneath the road, or in some cases, uh, you know, somebody's house. And uh, uh, there was a recent case in America where someone was actually killed because uh, they were in bed when, <laughs> when a solution hollow opened up underneath their house. Um, uh, the, so these things occur throughout... Um, throughout the world on, on these uh, calcareous uh, geologies. And um, they're, yeah, they're relatively frequent in the Stonehenge World Heritage Site, but to find them in a kind of perfect spatial arrangement like that is pretty unheard of. They're normally utterly irregular in terms of their, their geographical, their spatial arrangement. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, we have a, a question from Nica, Nicola Ray, and she asks, has Professor Mike considered the findings of John Michelle at Stonehenge in terms of the rather precise geometry? Hmm. Uh, as, as, I, as I say, um, if, if I don't know, Nicola, if you, if you know uh, uh, Andrew Chamberlain's work, but uh, that, yeah, his, his work really inf informed Andrew. And uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, Andrew came up with some quite convincing um, uh, 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 ideas about the measurement system. Okay, and uh, just a little comment from Simon. He says, thanks very much uh, for the answer. That's my summer holiday sorted, smiley face. Uh, so that's, that's good news. I'm glad there's a smiley face in there for you, Mike. Yeah. Um, and we've got a question from John Lord. Um, and he's, uh, he's asked, am I able to understand your theory that the stones of Wayne Morn represent those at Stonehenge were most uh, spotted dolerite? Um, also, when was spotted, spotted dolerite? Oh, he's just pointing out that wet spotted dolerite looks like the night sky, which I think you're aware of. But he just, you know, basically asking, you know, is that what made you you realise that they're from that wet, the particular site? Because they're the same type of uh, spotted dolerite or... Mm -hmm. The, the ones that, that are still there at Wine Mound, the four of them, are actually unspotted dolerite. And we know that uh, the, the, uh, the, the chippings we have from the stone that was, from a stone that was removed there, that those are also unspotted. Um, of course, we've only dug a tiny, tiny part of the, uh, of the circle. So we have no idea, firstly, if there are more stone holes, and if there are, what, what stones they would have, uh, would have contained. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that we're realizing is that this, although the spotted dolerites are the majority at the moment at Stonehenge, of course, there's only some, what, 43 blue stones plus the altar stone. Um, that's, that's only just over half of the grand total. So we, we've got a question of knowing how representative the spotted dolerites were. You know, I think one of the great things that the geologists, uh, Rob and Richard, have been doing is to, in a way, redress the balance and just point out how many different kinds of Welsh stone 
uh, fall within this category of bluestone. And you know, one of the things I'm really hoping that uh, we're going to be able to do in future years with the geologists is to actually pin down more of these sources of the different kinds of stone so we can get an idea of, of all of their relative importance. I mean, the spotted dolerites have, uh, you know, they've taken all the credit and all the glory from among, uh, amongst the blue stones, but yeah, I think we do need to recognize that they're just one, albeit the, the dominant type out of all the others. Okay, okay. and uh, we've got a question from Rollo. Um, and he asked, what is the solution connected with Professor Gaffney's pits? And is there any evidence for the rest of the Wayne Morn stones having come to Stonehenge other than the grooved hole that seems to fit that one in particular? Right. Um, at the moment, no, because uh, as I said, you know, it's, it's early days for that. Um, for, for Vince's pits, um, sorry, Rollo, what, what, was, what was the point maybe... You can explain. Yeah, is there any other ones? Because in, in the uh, documentary and I think in the lecture, you mentioned that there's one that kind of fit that you found. It kind yes. of fit it. But other, uh, you said, are there other ones that um, that are likely to be connected with Wayne Morn as well? Yeah. Um, at, at the moment, we yeah you know, we we know there are four stones left, and we found another six stone holes uh, that we can be sure had you know, blue stones of one sort or another in them. But it was only this one that had uh, chippings from the stone that had stood in it. Unfortunately, the others all seem to have been pulled out much more cleanly and didn't leave any debris behind. So we couldn't actually say what type of stone it was that had been sitting in there. But, uh, you know, they're, they're bluestone sized, uh, that is. And uh, uh, at the moment, we can only guess. Steve Marshall asks, uh, regarding the isotope analysis of animals eaten at Stonehenge, attention has shifted to whales as a possible origin, but couldn't Cornwall have been just as likely? He also says there are already proven links between Cornwall and Wiltshire, mm. from the much earlier pottery found at Windmill Hill, but this is rarely mentioned these days. Yeah, well, that's interesting, Steve. Um, we've been trying out, a, I say we, uh, our isotope uh, colleagues have been trying out an, an a, a, another method of, of isotope analysis, uh, lead isotopes. And um, it's possible with the lead to distinguish the southwestern, uh, particularly granitic areas, so Dartmoor, Bodmin Moor, uh, and so on, uh, from other areas uh, that otherwise might look similar in terms of those high strontium values. And they are clearly different. So you know, we can be fairly sure that uh, if we have got any animals coming from the Southwest Peninsula, they are very much in the minority of those that have that unusually high strontium value. Um, so uh, uh, our, our suspicion is that actually uh, very few, if any, would have come from, uh, from uh, Cornwall or Devon. Okay. And um, a question from David Schwartzman. Um, he asks, I think we've kind of partly answered this already, uh, when choosing the precise site to place Stonehenge, why were they drawn to this location? And he also asked, what, why do you think, um, do you think the glacial striations would have been visible back then? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, and I, I, think, I think that uh, the, uh, the periglacial stripes and the ridges that uh, define them on either side of them, uh, yeah, uh, May, may well be the reason why it's located precisely there, that Stonehenge has literally sat on the end of that particular feature. Um, and, and I initially was skeptical, uh, but it was our geomorphologists, Charlie French and Mike Allen, who said, well, actually do remember that uh, in the early post-glacial, you've got very little in the way of developed soils. And uh, in what would have been a relatively open landscape up on the Chalkland, which was never properly forested uh, after the last ice age, uh, such um, uh, features would show up, especially in very dry weather. So that in the if you had a summer period of parching, they'd show up very clearly. And uh, in fact, it was um, uh, someone else pointed out uh, they'd been working many years before for the late uh, Roger Mercer at Grimes Graves. And they pointed out that you can actually see one of these very clearly at certain times of the year uh, 
uh, nearby the, the Neolithic um, mines there, just to show that such things can be quite visible features in the landscape. And I think we also have to remember that the ridges themselves uh, would have been more prominent uh, because of course, since then we've had you know, 5,000 years of weathering, uh, which has reduced them as topographic features. Okay, uh, I've got a question from uh, Gail Higginbottom, one of our speakers. I've got to just lean in a bit because it's tiny text. Um, and she was wondering whether any of the earliest burials at Stonehenge mm. able to be um, sexed, i.e., you know, in particular those that came from a distance like Wales, or has any correlation been observed between sex and place of origin? Right. Um, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between sex and place of origin. Um, of course, numbers are quite small to be able to, to, to make uh, uh, such observations. But one of our most interesting burials is burial 007. Uh, and she was actually buried right on the, the very edge of Aubrey Hall 7. And she was an undisturbed grave when we uh, uh, were, were, were removing uh, the, the, the cremated remains from Aubrey Hall 7. And uh, you know, we were able really to construct quite an interesting life history for her uh, in that, yes, she grew up in the west of Britain, so consistent with, with being West Wales. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think, she, she died somewhere uh, around the age of 35. Uh, she had a hard life, um, uh, what we think was probably a nasty abscess in her jaw, and also... Uh, quite extensive osteoarthritis um, uh, and uh, her, her, her grave goods was a single animal tooth and a, um, a piece of, uh, of sarsen was, was placed on top of her grave pit. So uh, yeah, and she, she's one of the very first people basically to be buried at Stonehenge. Martin Sweatman is one of, another one of our speakers asks about the axe-like symbols seen by laser scanning at Stonehenge. Um, have you found tools like this in the excavations or he questions, are these not actually axe symbols? Right. What's interesting about them is that, um, uh, that their forms can be very closely uh, compared to the types of bronze axes that were being used in the period between 1700 and 1500 BC. So we're in the later part, well, the very end of the early Bronze Age. So of course, this is, you're right, uh, saying stage five, uh, uh, was uh, the last stage of, of the monument's construction. And um, um, we, you know, uh, the, I think their, their shape, it, it's a type of, you know, type of axe that we find throughout Britain and northern France. Um, uh, these, these are um, these are flanged flat axes. Um, I forget the uh, they've got a typological name that uh, it, it, it evades me at the moment. We don't have any from Stonehenge itself, but they're well known from southern Britain. Uh, uh, they often occur in hordes as well as uh, uh, separately as stray finds. OK, we've got uh, C.L. Yesbert has asked about, about the cranial deformation and about, you know, that's quite unusual to find in Britain. Um, I mean, is there, I mean, obviously you get a lot of that in places like Peru, you know, so is there, can there be any possible connection? Well, it was even being practised in 19th century France. Uh, and there were old ladies who had special skills of actually moulding infants' heads uh, to create a particular shape. Um, uh, and uh, there are many different parts of the world at different times that, um, that cranial modification has been practiced on infants. Um, uh, uh, from South America, Central America, North America, Europe, Asia, Africa. So yeah, pretty much every continent at some time or another. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think what, is, what has been interesting for us was, uh, this wasn't a new discovery. This was noticed in the 19th century by antiquarians, uh, people like Thomas Bateman digging in the Peak District. And then it really just got forgotten. And it was only uh, the osteologists on our Beaker People project 
that actually rediscovered it. And as we were going through the literature, we realized that somebody had already found out well before us. Uh, cool. We have another question from David Schwartzman. He asks about why were there the four stones left at Wayne Mound? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> um, we've we've thought about this. We've 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 come up with possibilities. You know, maybe those are the stones that belong to the groups that didn't want to go and said, "No, we're staying here." Actually, thank you very much. We're going to keep our ancestral symbols, our emblems here. Um, or, of course, it could be that if they were the you know the kind of property of certain lineages who'd been responsible for putting them up, maybe they died out. They didn't have any successors. Um, or somebody said, we, you know, we've got enough, thank you very much. We're not going to take those. Uh, or it's the sense that if you're dismantling the monument, you actually want to leave something which is actually a memorial rather than removing the whole lot. And all I can say was, that, you know, thank heavens they did, because I don't think we would ever have found that site um, because everything we threw at it in terms of geophysics and remote sensing just did not work at all. So good job they left four stones to uh, show us the way. And uh, Simon Banton just he's, he's got the last uh, little question or answer here. He thinks the site of the Bronze Axes was Araton or Araton. Yes, yes, very good on the Isle of Wight. Yes, Araton. Isle of Wight, right. Yeah, well done, Simon. Thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. So I think, yeah, well, that's that's all the official questions. And uh, I've got a question. I, I want to, what, what's, what's the next plan, especially mm. the whole Bluestone area and the mm. developments and discoveries you've made there? Have you got like a plan for the next few years about what's going, what's going to happen? Yep, yeah, I think so. And, you know, every season we go there thinking this is going to be it, finished, you know, done and dusted. And then something else turns up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, one of the things that, that may well be the case is that so quite possibly uh, Wine Mound was never actually completed. We know we've got a gap on the northwest side. It's not a full circle. Um, how many more stones you know, were there? And of course, it's just possible that, you know, that there weren't that many stones uh, actually uh, put up in that circle. And we've been wondering whether there might have been a series of other circles that were also contributing to Stonehenge and Blue Stonehenge. Uh, and you know, the fact that there were two of them in the Stonehenge area uh, should alert us to the likelihood that there was at least more than one in the Priscelli area that, that would have been uh, 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 drawn on. And you know, we know that the altar stone likewise comes from somewhere completely different. And I wonder if that comes from another monument um, the bluestone sandstones, although that type of sandstone uh, extends into the Priscelli area, none of the outcrops that we've seen are really quite the right type of sandstone. So they tend to be more mudstony rather than sandy. And I wonder if the, the, the Stonehenge sandstones of, uh, of bluestone type actually come from... Um, uh, maybe a, another site within South Wales, possibly nearer the centre of the um, uh, of the Paleozoic deposits that contain these sandstones. Maybe somewhere north of Carmarthen, for example. So that you know, that's that I think is what you know we'll be looking for is uh, you know, more needles in haystacks. Uh, are there actually other circles that contributed uh, bluestones to Stonehenge? Whether we'll be successful. Who knows? It's in the lap of the gods. Okay. <laughs> well, th thanks so much for your time, uh, Mike. We really appreciate it. We know it's getting late. We know you're super busy. So uh, just want to, everyone is probably clapping and we want to thank you for your lecture, <laughs> for your taking time to answer these questions and, uh, and all the, the work you've been doing. And it's a real pleasure to have you after three years of trying. Um, yes, yes but it's taken a while, but we've got you. <laughs> So uh, thanks again, and uh, yeah, you can uh, have, you can just uh, unmute, you can mute yourself, turn the camera off now, and I'll just say a few farewells. So thanks again, Mike. Everyone's saying goodbye, and uh, we'll hopefully speak to you again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank